everyone. I'm very humbled to be here and I'm really thankful for the trust that the Figma team put into us. Banner, that means really a world to me. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Vic. Uh, I mostly specialized in design systems, design infrastructure, mobile and dual scrum devices. Um, I originally come from Ukraine and I'm wearing a Ukrainian uh, dress today. Uh, but I live and work in Berlin starting from 2012. Um, I want to give a little preview of uh, what I did before um, today. I didn't take a very traditional path to design. I studied finance and I spent some time doing part, part jobs in service industry and decided this is probably not something that I enjoy. Um, and I took on my first design job in 2007 and in 2008, um, I basically started working a lot for startups. In 2018, I joined Microsoft to do and very recently I joined the GitHub team. And um, as a self-taught designer and someone who's struggling with imposter syndrome, um, it is very important that we give stage uh, to people and, and give opportunities to uh, beginners uh, who come into the community. Um, 2020 has been tough for many of us, uh, but I really have faith in our design community because what I've seen so far is a lot of kindness and thoughtfulness uh, on the behalf of designers. And so um, with this in mind, I wanna uh, open up a discussion about communicating design systems. Um, it is an observational case study that is informed by a series of conversations with system designers and my own experience uh, where I'm trying to uncover how we can have more productive conversations. Um, and this talk is ideal for someone who's already a little familiar with design systems, but I'm trying to explain it in very simple terms. Um, so follow along. I want to frame it first. Uh, for a design system to work, it needs to embrace the company's characteristics and peculiarities. This is a quote from system designers at Spotify. And um, you know, what are the peculiarities that we talk about? Uh, these are design and tech stack, size and capacity of your team, maturity of your design system, number of design systems that you maintain or source, and products' very specific needs and goals. And so the intersection of our needs is so unique that sometimes, um, you know, the, the showcases that we see do not necessarily uh, answer our questions. And so I tried to make this talk not a showcase and not a solution to a specific problem, um, but it's a critical look and an observational case study on the state of design systems. And so, you know, this is about the, unique intersection, in other word, words, it depends. Um, design systems now. Uh, let's review our systems when before we had design systems. Uh, let's review our process before we had design systems. We had a user and we had a need that a user had that a product would satisfy. A product will consider satisfying this need. Um, Either it is, you know, so they will file a feature request, it will go into the backlog, uh, the feature is going to be implemented, and the need is going to be satisfied. And so this is how it looks with design systems. Um, you know, if the design pattern is available, um, great, it goes into the development backlog, and the need of a user is satisfied. But if it doesn't, we have to kind of go through this roadblock of uh, making it a case study, uh, making a case, auditing the design, triaging and planning uh, how to implement this pattern, make it accessible, responsive, scalable to other features, passing usability tests, compliant with platform guidelines, then implementing it in all of our diverse toolkits in light and dark modes and whatever modes you're maintaining and properly documenting it, that it goes into the engineering backlog and fingers crossed that they have time to jump on it uh, straight away. And engineering has to go through a very similar process 
of implementing it in all toolkits, in all nodes, making it accessible, making it responsive, compliant with dev guidelines and compliant with platform guidelines. At this point, um, your feature that, that you were initially working on may already be live, uh, but the pattern is still in development. And what if you maintain a number of different design systems and you need also to keep your documentation up to date? And so the question is, has design gotten too complex? If the form follows function and design process is just a reflection of our product needs and our product needs are a reflection of our user needs um, our, and our needs as product designers and consumers have just gotten more and more complex over time. Um, our world, world has gotten more complex. Our teams has gotten more bigger, uh, bigger um, and more diverse and spread apart than ever. As Mark points out here, if you haven't done all 154 of these things, you failed at design systems. And this is really a checklist that contains 154 different things that people have to keep in mind whenever they're designing a system. Um, you can see that it kind of it hits the home base for a lot of people. Um, and so we're in design systems supposed to fix the way we work. Um, we were supposed, with design systems, we were supposed to reach engineering and design. Um, but our tooling is still optimized for uh, graphic design, and we keep building around these processes uh, like to, to replicate our actual development processes, uh, like, for example, uh, version control and all the different plugins and sourcing data from production to populate um, design mockups. And doesn't it make our, our lives a little bit more complex? Design systems is, in, is intended as an intergroup support structure. It is a horizontal level to support um, the needs of your product teams. And it is yet another team on your org chart. Components are easy, collaboration is hard. Uh, you can see that with three people, you have only three different uh, communication lines. But with 55 people, it, with 11 people, this increases to 55 different lines of communication. And what if you're working for a bigger company, a company like Microsoft, where, you know, last time I looked, it was 144,000 people. Just to iterate on this, Mina says, a design system is a cross-functional partnership. And she designed a design system for Hillary Clinton. Um, and I can't agree with this more. I think it is a partnership of two very distinct roles. It's a role of a design systems creator and the role of a design systems consumer. <clears throat> it might not be always a clear cut like this, but what I mean, um, and this is done for the simplicity of this talk, is that um, you know there are creators of a system, basically the maintainers and contributors, the people who upkeep the system and keep it alive, and there are consumers, those people who use the system in order to be able to have a consistent and scalable language um, to satisfy our user needs. And I'm going to keep calling them creators and consumers throughout the talk. Um, so please call, keep that in mind. Um, I might not necessarily use design system creators or design system consumers, but when I refer to creators and consumers, uh, those would be directly uh, those of design systems. <coughs> Um, in a survey done by Sparkbox in 2019, uh, here are all the different reasons for failure of design systems. Um, two of them are the bigger ones. So that there is this adoption uh, reason and maintenance. Uh, and so I want to tie them back closely to our roles. Maintenance means that creators experience problems with their system, maintaining the system. And consumers mean that they have troubles consuming or adopting the system. There is a lot of discourse uh, in Twitter folklore about this. The paradox of design systems, everyone wants one, no one wants to adhere to one, and every designer developer thinks one, uh, using one, thinks they know better than the people building it. 
It's arrogance slowing down the professionalization of our discipline. We need to collectively grow up. Here's another one. Please design system, no design constraints, only design system. I hope I impersonated this dog um, well enough. <clears throat> and so there is a lot of discourse around this tension of two different groups, the consumers and the creators. And everyone needs a design system, but doesn't want the constraints that come with it. This uh, tweet specifically inspired this entire talk. And if Garrett is for some uh, reason is listening to this, thank you so much for spending time talking to me and trying to untangle um, our very complex relationships. So Garrett says, uh, systems are just a reflection of your organization ability to decide on a single answer across disparate groups. And I think this rings very true for design systems. If you don't have the culture yet for triaging these questions uh, in your team, it is very hard to have productive conversations. Um, so I'm trying to answer the question, how do we build a culture for arriving at a simple single answer in conversations between creators and consumers? It starts with the right foundation for the job. <clears throat> a case in point, uh, when I used to do when, when I used to work for Microsoft, I used to work for a very small um, Berlin based team um, product team uh, called Microsoft to do. Um, and we used to be, work in a very in a bigger kind of ecosystem of different products. Um, and we worked within the uh, Microsoft language uh, framework. Um, at that time, Microsoft Fluent was an open source cross-platform design system, which it still is. Um, but the language was initially designed for web. And so mobile effort was about bringing it to uh, mobile office apps, and we were basically uh, another app on, on the line of these diverse apps um, that had, you know, millions of users across the world. And uh, we heard from a number of different users that they really value the familiarity and consistency. And so we ventured out on, on creating a more consistent language, uh, or the Fluent team ventured out on, on doing that. And I was lucky to be a part of the of this conversation. And so this is how our collaboration worked in the very beginning. We had a centralized team that worked out of the US. And this was also before the pandemic hit. So we didn't really have the tools or didn't even have the conversations about how we can productively work remotely. Um, and we had a number of these product teams that were just scattered around the globe. Um, so you can see that you know all of the all of these creators were basically um, kind of focused in the design system, uh, while uh, product teams were also very isolated. And so we had lots of isolated and conversations and and siloed development in those, and we had um, big divide between different roles. You know, if, if we reiterate on the kind of intergroup tension that we experienced, you probably would experience something very similar. We have little interest and involvement, lack of direction and guidance, uh, lack of transparency on all levels, diverging opinions and product needs, lack of empowerment to bring change, and disjointed conversations and siloed development. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, this, this of course indicated on, onto a general um, lack of organization around systems and areas of ownership, but it also indicated a lot of tension around the, the roles of consumers and creators. Um, let's backtrack a little and try to untangle why do we have a lot of tension around these roles? You know, design systems emerged from the need to have a design system, design language um, and, you know, our process that's both consistent and scalable. Um, and so everyone shares the same big picture motivation, uh, but we, be, because we added so many structures to it, um, we now have uh, individual teams and team members with different motivations and different incentives. So we have a product team that exists to satisfy user needs, uh, while using a clear design language. This is exactly why and how design systems emerged. Um, and we have a design system team 
uh, that exists to support this product teams. And both teams work towards one shared goal. It kind of sounds simple, right? But at the same time, because we have these different um, incentives, uh, we might have different needs. Um, and so, you know, with the design system, consistency comes at a cost of constraints. And uh, consumers need to know that constraints are reasonable and that they allow satisfy, to satisfy user needs in the best way possible when they operate within the system. And so there is this very fragile balance. If the system doesn't satisfy our consumers' needs, uh, consumers are not likely to use the system. If consumers don't use the system, uh, then our design is inconsistent and our uh, development is non-scalable. And so, uh, you know, in, in the end, both development and product suffers consequences. Um, we need to really establish the right foundation for the job. Uh, we need to acknowledge, and this is basically just the baseline expectation, that our shared goal is consistency in design and user experience, and that consumers see the value of design system while creators hear consumers' needs and satisfy and address them. So just to reiterate on what Nina says, a design system is a cross-functional partnership. And so, you know, we established the right foundation uh, and we are more, we have a mutual understanding of our shared goals. How can we have more productive conversations? Um, we can go back to our teams for a second. And the idea that helped me get onto, into this very collaborative mode is that every consumer is not yet an onboarded creator. Um, in order to kind of level the playing field for all the different consumers and creators, we could think of consumers as basically another kind of, if you think about the structure of creators and consumers, creators is another tier. Um, so we have, for example, different access to tools and different individual incent incentives but we're working towards one goal. Um, can we start blurring out the lines around the roles, incentivize consumers to contribute and give them support and access to creators' tools? And then, you know, if you take a look at our needs, our needs always also overlap uh, a lot. Uh, yes, design systems consumers uh, are focused on really satisfying user needs, uh, with feature work, but also they want to help evolve the system and know how to navigate and use it optimally and keep up with the systems change. And this is true also for design system creators who are, um, apart from these uh, different uh, goals, they also want to maintain and contribute and help consumers navigate and use the system and communicate changes. <clears throat> And so what we tried, what, this, what the teams tried to do is, uh, can we start blurring out lines between those roles? Can we identify the people who are actually passionate about design systems and try involving them back into our process and help them onboard and, and build? And at the same time, can we also build those communication bridges or reporting lines that help um, these passionate people uh, bring everything they know about design systems into their own respective product teams while also informing the design system about the needs they need to address. And so communication bridges were about identifying and bringing your creators and consumers together, clarifying their roles and responsibilities, creating clear decision-making and contribution processes, and enabling contribution for consumers passionate about design while also having product, productive conversations. Talking about productive conversations, our design system is a meeting, says Shannon from Braintree, and I can't agree more. Um, there needs to be a unified shared space where uh, conversations between these groups could spark, all, spark ser serendipitous answers and discussions, and people could bring their concerns and questions and get them answered. And if there was a person who actually can answer those, uh, that's really successful. And so um, 
it was about identifying what's critical for your creators to know, what's critical for your consumers to know, when it's being communicated, where it's being communicated, and who's responsible for communicating that. And then establishing soft infrastructure around those, um, creating communication channels, office hours and consumer support where questions from consumers can be answered by creators, uh, documentation that's accessible and clear newsletters and change logs so that um, both creators and consumers can follow on the recent changes made in the design system, ongoing and planned work streams so people know that their needs are addressed in those and also can jump into and participate and community meetings like training and lightning talks and brown bags that can spark interest in design systems. We also saw that we needed to steer conversations away from bike shedding. And bike shedding is a term to describe a, like a law of triviality, where a committee for a, a nuclear power plant is dis, the, deciding on the kind of materials for the staff bike shed instead of actually focusing on what's mat what matters. If you spend a lot of time um, you know, discussing the, the border radius for your uh, buttons or uh, color of blue or a shade of blue that you're using, it means you're bike shedding. Um, and we still do that a lot uh, in conversations, you know, not only within the design system, but also outside of design system. And uh, what helped us in our team is that we could steer these conversations towards what makes a good component. And these are very practical things, like make it accessible, make it responsive, following usability heuristics, compliant with platform guidelines, passes usability tests, compliant with product and brand guidelines, and scalable to other features. We also needed to occasionally step back and take a broader look at how we're solving this because of course the, the, the list helped us uh, to stay in check, uh, but we also needed to understand, does it improve our customer experience? Um, does it actually solve the problem that we initially set out to solve? And does it give leverage to our product teams? Um, you know, does it give our teams the consistency and the scalability that they are actually calling for when using design systems? And so shared goals. We set our foundation and we build communication bridges to have productive conversations. Um, can we now, sorry, can we now maybe connect these groups even more and make them even work closer together? You know, if there were groups uh, where people could share their problems and rally about the same kind of issues and share the burden of iteration and research and implementation, wouldn't well, that would be really great? And so um, there were these work streams that were called B-teams or virtual teams within Microsoft, they're focused on shared problems of product teams. So for example, things like uh, dark mode, which was of course very high impact because people love dark mode, um, or low effort, uh, like Fluent Icons work stream or Illustration Coherence work stream. And so Fluent shared patterns that make up 80% of the coherent experience across the ecosystem. So that meant that we didn't really aim for 100% of coherency. I don't even think this is possible, um, especially, you know, with, with the bigger teams and spread across the uh, continents. Uh, so these are things like shared design language, color typography, and all these kinds of primitives. And then shared UI controls like navigation and lists and people and cards, uh, shared UX patterns like collaboration and search. And so instead of striving to build identical interfaces, we designed for familiarity. Um, we knew that at some point we would diverge just because you know some miscommunication issue happened or not everyone was aligned. 
uh, or we did that intentionally just because our product needs were very different. But we would be still successful if users recognize that these experiences as familiar. I want to wrap up um, with a reminder that we were all beginners at some point. I practiced beginner's mindset uh, my entire career, and I somehow always feel like I'm a beginner. <laughs> Um, but maybe that's a part of a syndrome, uh, imposter syndrome that I'm experiencing. Um, but I want to remind you that looking at someone else's system for the first time can be really, really overwhelming. But it is very easy to, to forget as we get to know it. Imagine 75% of your team members are not hired yet. Can we simplify the path of onboarding onto the system? Um, and so the idea is that you try to reduce the surface area in order to uh, reduce the time to onboard. Maybe you can, we can select just five core modules that our consumers or contributors need to master. And so these are things like, and like in every learning system, you start with very basic things like design principles and primitives. Uh, color and typography and iconography. And then you continue on to more complex things and you learn to put them together. Uh, so these are like uh, component designs and tooling and processes. Um, and I just want to show a couple of examples from the industry. So this is a component lifecycle um, from Azure DevOps. And this, are, this is basically an attempt to answer the most common ask questions by uh, consumers or contributors, um, you know, it always starts with something simple, like I need a component and does it exist in a system? And it basically just walks you through all of these questions. Um, here's another one. I really love this one. Um, and I really encourage to Google um, this decision tree by Orbit and open source design system by Kiwi. Um, and basically, it guides you through selecting the right uh, button for the job. Um, and it, you know, you can go very, very deep uh, into the rabbit hole of selecting the right button, just because there probably exists like a number of, um, I don't know, dozens of these variations. Another idea is to how provide with a similar level onboarding experience for your new design system users is to have a video onboarding. And this has been something very successful at GitHub as well. Um, we have started using uh, you know, uh, tools like Loom to not only um, record conversations, but uh, also to onboard people. Um, I think with all of these things, including video onboarding, it's very hard to um, keep them up to date, but at the same time, you know, if if you're uh, willing to maybe make it not very perfect, um, it's a great way to make sure that onboarding is of a similar quality for everyone, independently on their, uh, you know, uh, location or the time that they join. And so to recap, the right foundation for the job. Um, we need the foundation um, and we need to see through our individual incentives um, towards a more kind of a unified shared goal, which is building consistent and scalable user experience. And without this foundation, we can't have productive conversations and we can't start addressing, um, you know, the tension between both of these groups. We should um, also remember uh, we should, that the goal of this conversation is to ensure that everyone's voices are heard and their needs are addressed and build potentially shared work streams around those. Um, we should also remember that we were once new to the system and that we need to ease the burden of onboarding onto the system by reducing its complexity. I'm hopeful that with, um, you know, with the current situation, in the design community, uh, we can have our conversations more productive um, and our teams uh, can be more thoughtful and we can build better inclusive systems. Um, I wanna thank to all of these fine folks um, who spent hours and hours of their time talking to me. Uh, thank you so much.